Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to this edition of Let's Ask. Uh, I'm Caroline. My colleague Nina Dieters put this program together, but she couldn't be here tonight, so I'll be your host. Um, in Let's Ask, we ask uh, expert researchers uh, to shed some light on current events, topics, and in tonight's edition, we welcome Nicolaas <laughs> Kraft van Ermel, uh, and we'll be um, talking about uh, the different historical narratives that Russia and Ukraine have been presenting and the uh, incongruences between them. And uh, I think everyone who's been watching the news has noticed that the stories are very different. So hopefully tonight we'll learn some more about um, how all of that works historically. Uh, Nicolaas is a historian for the Rug and uh, also affiliated with the Netherlands Russia Center, um, which promotes cultural exchange between the countries. <laughs> Switch on the microphone, that's better, I guess. Cultural exchange, business exchange, uh, government institutions, so basically everything which we can't do right now. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, complicated matter for you right that's, now, undoubtedly. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, after the talk, we'll uh, have time for questions, discussion, and um, yeah, enjoy. So I'll have to switch the presentation on. Oh, I need to, re I need to close this one down. So, yeah, it's uh, rather unfortunate that we are all here. Um, like, I like talking to groups, that's not the problem, but... Um, well, until recently, I had a fairly obscure research niche, which was Ukra which is Ukrainian nationalism um, and um, the usage of history by Ukrainian politicians. Um, until recently, I sometimes had to explain that Ukraine is a country. Nowadays, I don't have to do that anymore. You might also have noticed, I'm an historian, that I have gained a colleague in the last few weeks. Um, this is how he looks, right? Um, so right before invading Ukraine, before launching a war of aggression, the Russian president Vladimir Putin gave a speech on Russian state television, a one hour long speech, a speech which was basically a history lesson. And this was not the first time Putin uh, affiliated himself with uh, Ukrainian and Russian history and the history in between of them. He already gave a kind of warning shot in July of last year. A 12-page, at least when I printed, a 12-page article with the same kind of narrative as Putin had in his speech of 21 February. The thing is, in his speech, he staked a few central claims, uh, claims. One of them was about the U.S. and the role the U.S. has in international affairs. I'll leave that one for the specialists who, who do that. And there were four claims about Ukraine, and I feel that I'm competent to speak about those. So, the first claim is that Ukraine is not an independent nation. Ukraine is just an inseparable part of the Russian nation. Second one is that Ukraine is an invention by the Bolsheviks, who, the Russian communists, who wanted to have a separate Ukraine basically because they felt that their political program couldn't be realized in Russia uh, without carving up pieces of Russian territory into separate republics. And then we come to the third one, which is really interesting, namely that Ukraine and the very existence of Ukraine is actually uh, meant by the West as a launch pad for anti-Russian policies. And then finally, that Ukraine is ruled by uh, a regime filled with neo-Nazis or Nazis since the coup, the supposed supposed coup in 2014. In his speech, Putin refers to history constantly, and in such a way that his narrative makes sense to people who 
um, are familiar with Russian uh, narrative, uh, but generally not for Western audiences. To our ears, this feels like a rather awkward, um, strange version of reality which we generally don't recognize. So for us, his claims are remarkable. But if you have studied Russian history, if you studied Ukrainian history, these things aren't particularly new. Um, Putin has consistently made such claims at least since the early 2000s. Um, but he never put them in a one coherent narrative. And he um, never pressed them so hard and so comprehensively as right before he launched his war on Ukraine. And anyone familiar with, anyone familiar with these histories also knows that this stands in a longer tradition. These claims aren't new. They stand in a tradition which goes back at least to the 19th century, probably earlier. Uh, it has also been used by uh, the Soviet regime to legitimate its power over Ukraine. So this is just a, a repeat of, of history which we already knew. So what I want to do with you, I want to examine these claims and see what is fact, what is Putin's reality, what is a more Ukrainian reality, and what is a more sensible, like helicopter view reality. So, Ukraine as an inseparable part of the Russian nation. In his speech, Putin said, I repeat one other time, for us, Ukraine is not just a neighboring country. It is an integral part of our history, culture, and spiritual space. They are our comrades and close ones, amongst which there are not only our colleagues, friends, former military service pals, but also our relatives and people with whom we are connected in our blood and family ties. Inhabitants of the southwest of the historic old Russian lands, this is Putin's word for saying Ukraine, um, called themselves Russians and Orthodox since time immemorial. This was the case until the 17th century when a part of these uh, territories reunited with the Russian state and afterwards. So um, Putin basically says here Ukraine is not an independent nation and these people who live there are simply Russians. Um, and the, the bad part is that to explain this, we have to go back to the Middle Ages, unfortunately. So in the 8th century, what is now Ukraine, Belarus, Western Russia, was a tribal federation. And these Eastern Slavic tribes called themselves the Rus. And slowly, these tribes tran um, transformed into principalities. And these principalities, the main one was the Principality of Kiev. And in the year 988, the Grand Prince of Kiev, Vladimir in Russian, Volodymyr in Ukrainian, um, converted to Christianity. And did so in the Byzantine form the later orthodox form of Christianity, the Greek form. And um, why, why this, this form of Christianity? The Rus were on the major, major trade routes from Scandinavia to Constantinople, and in this power field, conversion to this form of Christianity was the most logical step. The power center here is Kiev. Um, and this conversion to Christianity is very important, as we will hear later on. The thing is, this, by now, principalities uh, uh, federation called Rus, slowly disintegrates. First, because of internal struggles. Um, there is a problem with inheritance laws. Basically, you get sons fighting with um, brothers for their share of the inheritance. Secondly, in the 13th century, there are invaders from the east, the Mongols, or the Tatars, as they are called in this region of Europe. 
And those two things combined make end this, um, well, state, so to say, Kievan Rus. And what happens is that the west of this, this Kievan Rus falls into a power vacuum, which is filled first by the Lithuanians and after that by the Poles. The east remains under Tartar rule much longer, which in Russian history is called the Tartar yoke. Um, which in practice means that the principalities in the east have to pay tribute to the Mongol Khan um, and have to supply troops for the Mongol army. That's what it means. The problem in our day and age is that both Russia and Ukraine claim this as their cradle. Um, this ruse, with Kiev as its capital, is the cradle of both Russian and Ukrainian national history. And they s uh, seek to lay an exclusive claim to this history. And that's one of the problems. Um, so the Russian story is, this was Russia back then. And they then, of course, you can say, well, the people were called Rus. And of course, this is etymolo et etymologically related to Russia. Like, we can hear that very easily. But the Ukrainians would say, no, 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 those... Those people in the East have nothing to do with, with, with this construct. This is our heritage. Sharing is difficult. Looks to me, just imagine that the Netherlands and Belgium today would say, well, Charles the Great, well, he is Dutch, or he was Belgian, or maybe the Germans would have a claim on him as well. And we would make that an exclusive claim. But that's essentially one of the problems which happens here. So the West of this, this realm what is now Ukraine and Belarus first falls in sway of Lithuania and then in the sway of Poland. And of course, in European history, Lithuania and Poland go together because in the 14th century, they formed a dynastic union which essentially later became a state called the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. But if I say Poland, you probably would all say... Catholicism, right? We know the Poles as a very Catholic people. And that's what Poland brings to, to, to the eastern part of their realm as well. So what you see is that what is today Ukraine um, and what is today Russia, they have the same kinds of roots. But from those roots, they developed in very different ways. So in the West, where we can find to, uh, Ukraine today, that becomes part of a much more Western cultural space with Western Christianity. Um, there are even forms in the 16th century a special Ukrainian or uh, Ruthenian, as it is called, form of Christianity, the Uniate Church, a church which uses the Byzantine liturgy, but... Um, recognizes that the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, is the head of the church. This causes religious tensions, and some of the uh, Polish king's orthodox subjects, um, more in the east, they um, want to express their orthodoxy. Their, and they, they are called the Cossacks, and they have their own... I would say, martial society in the, the southeast of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And there are constant conflicts between the Polish king, who wants to bring Catholicism to the region, and um, his Orthodox subjects. Which means that in what is today Ukraine, there are several bearers for separate identities. If we go to the east, there is one principality, the principality of Moscow, or Muscovy, as it's usually called, which becomes the strongest. And um, Moscow, in Russian national history, um, throws off what's called the Tartar yoke, so the overlordship of the Mongols in the 15th century. And they uh, proclaim, the, 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 the princes of Moscow proclaim themselves to be czars of Russia, in 1547, and the word Tsar is, of course, a Russification of the word Caesar. 
So they explicitly also put themselves in the, in the tradition of the Eastern Roman Empire, of Byzantium. And their history becomes very different. They claim themselves to be a vestige for orthodoxy, a final stronghold for orthodoxy, especially after the fall of um, Constantinople to the Ottomans in 1453. And they spin up the narrative of Moscow as the, as the third Rome, a very important concept, but it basically means, well, you have the first Rome, the Rome we all know, the Rome in Italy, it has fallen. Then you have the second Rome, which is Byzantium. It has fallen. The reasons for that are moral corruption um, and unchristian things. And now Moscow is the third Rome, and Moscow will be the final Rome. And this means Russia, or Moscow, is a very inward-looking entity. Uh, literally, like, um, traders are welcome. Foreign traders are welcome in Moscow, but they have to live in a separate quarter which is uh, closed down at night, that isolated. And this stays so until, uh, it stays this way until Peter the Great, at the end of the 17th century, opens up Russia. So you can say even before, like the formation of national identities in the 19th century, Russia and Ukraine have parted ways, and have parted ways in radically different ways. If you look at the map here, you can see that Muscovy starts out as a very tiny principality and gains territory, gains huge territories. There are, however, two things which are missing from the Russian perspective. Um, one of that is access to the sea. So, um, Russia is always looking for ways to have a coastline. That's one. And two, Russia has no natural defenses. You can literally walk from the North Sea coast all the way to China without en encountering any serious mountains. So, from a Russian perspective, it makes sense to have huge swaths of territory especially in the West, so that you can be invaded, draw back, and then conquer the enemy when his, his lines of logistics are very long, um, he's drawn into the Russian winter, those kinds of things, say Napoleon, 1812. So, um, but Russia seeks those two things. It seeks extra territory, and it seeks access to the sea which means conflict with the major Baltic power of the time, which is Sweden, and also with the major land country next to, to Moscow, which is Poland and Lithuania. And, you know, war is a very complicated thing. War can go two ways. You can either win or lose. And Russia does both. So, for instance, in 1612, Moscow is taken by Catholic Polish forces, which also happened to put a puppet on the Russian throne. So, um, and this leaves deep wounds in, in Russian national consciousness uh, also. That's something you can hear in Putin's speech he gave earlier this year. But in the end, Moscow gains territory. Um, <coughs> And one of the ways it gains territory is by approaching these Cossacks I was t talking about. They live in um, the area, the striped area over here, which uh, is called Zaporizhia in Ukrainian or Zaporozhia in Russian. Um, and um, these Orthodox Cossacks, who are unhappy with the rule by a Polish Catholic king and by his Catholic policies, they rebel in, in 1648. And um, they seek allies. And one of the allies they settle on is, of course, the, the Tsar in Moscow, the, the, the Orthodox Tsar in Moscow. And, but they seek an alliance. The Tsar sees it another way. 
He sees it as a reunification of ancient Russian lands with Russia. So Russia has an appetite for extra territory in the West, which is like we can, uh, we can understand why Russia wants it, but it has an appetite for this territory. And it, it's, it starts to use the history, the medieval history of the area, and the orthodox religion of the people who live there as an alibi to annex it. And this remains the case throughout history. So when in the 18th century, Polish, Poland and Lithuania are weak states, um, or is a weak state, the three major powers surrounding it, Russia, the Habsburg Empire, and Prussia, they divide Poland to uh, prevent a mutual conflict over that. And um, again, Russia uses the pretext of these are ancient Russian lands, and the people here are orthodox, and we need to protect them to legitimize what they are doing. Also note that part of Ukraine, this part here, the border is about here, becomes Habsburg. And in the 19th century, the, the Habsburg Empire has a f more relaxed policy towards the Ukrainians, and this is also the reason why um, nowadays Western Ukraine is much more nationalist than the East. So, if we enter the 19th century, Russia again turns inwards. It is shocked by the, um, the French Revolution, everything which came um, uh, about because of the French Revolution, especially the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, there are liberals in Russian society, no, no doubt, but um, the official line is that Russia turns inwards and becomes a convert, convert conservative force. Um, and you can describe the 19th century in Russia as a struggle between, say, liberalism and reform, or conservative and reform. And this becomes problematic if you consider that everywhere in the Russian Empire there are nationalities and there is nationalism as a new force. So, and one of the problematic nationalities are the Poles. Um, and they have their first uprising already in 1794 and they have several uprisings in the 19th century. And keep note that because of the mutual history um, like Russia has a claim on these Ukrainian territories, but Poland also has that. It has been Polish for quite some years, as we have seen. So, um, you might imagine that Ukraine gets squashed between two uh, very complicated claims. And due to these struggles, Russian national narrative starts to empathize its claim on the Ukrainian territories. They start to call it Little Russia, or Mala Russia, um, to undermine any Polish claim to these territories. And the narrative becomes that these Ukrainians, or these people who call themselves Ukrainians, they are actually just Little Russians, who have forgotten that they are Russian. Um, um, who have been corrupted by Polish influence. In the year 1863, the, the Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Pyotr Valuyev, introduces a ban on most, almost all publications in the Ukrainian language, which he doesn't call by name. He calls it the Little Russian language. They, he refers to studies, DOM, linguistic studies DOM, clearly indicate that a separate Little Russian language never existed, doesn't exist, and cannot exist. And that the dialect that is spoken by them, the common people, is the same Russian language that is only corrupted by influences from Poland. The common Russian language is as comprehensible for Little Russians as for the Great Russians, which are the, the Russians, so to say. And even more comprehensible than the language that is currently crafted for them by some little Russians, and especially by the Poles, the so-called Ukrainian language. 
So when Putin says Ukraine is not a nation, Ukraine doesn't exist, it's a 19th century tradition. It stands in a much older tradition. And here also that, he, that in the 19th century it were the Poles who were using Ukraine as a way to undermine Russia. In last year, in his article, Putin expressed exactly the same argument. Step by step, Ukraine was driven in a dangerous geopolitical game. The goal of this was to change Ukraine in a buffer between Europe and Russia and into a bridgehead against Russia. Unavoidably, the time that the conception Ukraine is not Russia was no longer sufficient arrived. There was a need for an anti-Russia, which we will never accept. And he then continues, and the most reprehensible is that Russians in Ukraine are not only forced to betray their roots, their generations of ancestors, but they also need to believe that Russia is their enemy. It is not an exaggeration that the state, that the course towards the forced assimilation, the formation of an ethnically pure Ukrainian state, which is aggressive towards Russia, has the same consequences as the use of weapons of mass destruction against us. As a consequence of such a deep artificial rift between Russians and Ukrainians, the Russian people can communicate... Com uh, difficult word. <laughs> Cumulative... Cumul uh, well, you get the word. Uh, diminish with hundreds of thousands, if not millions. So basically what Putin says here, that the existence of the Ukrainian nation is essentially the same as committing genocide against the Russian nation. That's what he says, if you read between the lines. Well, and this is just 19th century thinking, brought to an extreme. And then there is the notion that Ukraine is a Russian or maybe even Soviet creation. So Putin says, as I've said, Soviet Ukraine, that we may name fully as Vladimir Lenin's Ukraine, factually came into being as a result of Bolshevik politics. He, Lenin, is its author and architect. This is entirely and fully supported by archival documents, including Lenin's firm directives on the Donbass, the, that's the region with the two separatist republics, which was literally stuffed in the structures of Ukraine. And now the grateful descendants, the Ukrainians, have taken down Lenin statues all over Ukraine. They call this decommunization. Do you want decommunization? Well, this search is just fine. However, it's not necessary, as one says, to stop halfway. We are prepared to show you what true de decommunization will mean for Ukraine. When I heard this, this was before the, the war started, I knew, okay, it's going to be war. Because what Putin basically says is, the, the Russian communists created Ukraine. You want to get rid of the legacy of communism, which is true. There are extensive government policies in Ukraine, nationalist policies, which seeks to do that. Um, but, okay, you want to get rid of that? Well, we'll show you what it means for you. And it means much more than you expect it to be. The thing is, Ukraine is one of the many, many republics which comes to being after the Russian Revolution. So, um, at the end of the First World War, you have the Russian Revolution, and many peripheral territories in the Russian Empire seek independence, and Ukraine is, is one of them. They have their own socialist-inspired republic, the Ukrainian People's Republic, the Ukrainska Narodna Respublika, um, which declares its full independence after the communist grab power in, um, in, in Petrograd. There are also um, Ukrainians from the Habsburg Empire, which um, then joined this construct in 1918. 
after the Habsburg Empire disintegrates. Um, the thing is, is this a viable state? And it isn't. Um, it isn't a viable state because basically Ukrainian nationalism is a national identity which comes into being rather late in history. So the, po the Poles are much further in their development as a modern nation. The Russians are much further in their development as a modern nation. And you can name, save for the Belarusians, any nationality in the region, and they are further in their development as a modern nation in, in 1918. So Ukraine immediately comes, becomes involved in what we can call the Russian Civil War, a war with just so many, many parties. We have the Reds, so we have the Communists and the Red Army. And there are Ukrainians who are communist. Um, that's something Ukrainian nationalists nowadays find difficult to believe, but they did exist, really. Um, and there are the Whites, the monarchists. The Reds want a, a, a communist or socialist state. The Whites want to restore the Russian Empire. But there are also the Greens. Um, countryside uprisings by farmers who are unhappy with the situation. There are anarchists, and in Ukraine there is a very famous anarchist called Nestor Makhno, who has his own army and seeks to have an anarchist-ruled entity in southern Ukraine. And then there are the various other national movements, and for us one is of major importance, um, the Poles. And the Ukrainians in this difficult war they are one of the many competing parties, and they're relatively weak. They're relatively weak because they have very much internal division, and because Ukrainian nationalism is simply not so well developed in the, uh, at the turn of the 20th century. So, in the end, the Ukrainians lose in the Russian Civil War, and then, Soviet Russia enters a war with their new neighbor, being Poland. Uh, and reluctantly, the Ukrainian nationalists then ally themselves with Poland. And this becomes a long and protected, protracted war. Um, and in the end, well, it, find, it, it almost went wrong. Like you can see in August 1920 that the Red Army is just like at the gates of Warsaw. History could have been very different if Poland was beaten in this war. Then the communist Germany in, say, the 1920s would have been perfectly feasible. Um, but in the end, Poland, re Poland recovers in this war, and they, this Soviet Russia and um, Poland settled down on a peace treaty, the Treaty of Riga in 1921. Um, just, can you see a Ukraine on the map here? No. So, um, like, neither Poland nor the Soviets are happy with this outcome. They all want more territory. Um, the Soviet Union feels robbed of a world revolution and becomes a revisionist state. They want to revise the borders post-World first, 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 first World War, so to say. Just like, say, Nazi Germany wants to do, or Germany wants to do in the entire interwar period. Although there is no Ukraine as an independent state, there is a Ukraine in the interwar periods. There is a Ukrainian socialist, Repu socialist Soviet Republic within the Soviet Union. It's one of the founding republics of the Soviet Union. The thing is, First of all, there are many Ukrainians who actually believe in communism in this, in this era. Second, the Bolsheviks have learned from the Civil War that nationalism and national identity is a thing which they need to do something with. And that's why you get national republics, the Ukrainian Republic, a Belarusian Republic. There are republics in the Caucasus and in, 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 um, in, in Central Asia as well. And these um, national republics, they start to encourage, like, uh, Ukrainians in, in the Ukrainian Republic have um, cultural and linguistic freedoms. That's even stimulated. Develop yourself. But what's not possible is 
political nationalism. But cultural nationalism is perfectly okay in the 1920s, at least in the early 1920s. That's explicitly encouraged. However, at the end of the 1920s, this national communism, as it is called, comes under suspect. And in the 1930s, when Stalin needs, Ukraine has one big asset, we will all notice that in the com f following years, we, that it grows grain. Um, so we will all be paying more for our bread. Um, and Stalin also knows that Ukraine is good territory for agriculture. And Stalin wants to uh, industrialize the Soviet Union, wants to give it a modern industrial economy in order for it to be ready to fight a major war. So to, do, to pay for that, he needs Ukrainian grain. He needs to export Ukrainian grain. To feed the new worker population in the Soviet Union, he needs the Ukrainian grain. And not only Ukrainian grain, also Kazakh grain, and there are other agricultural regions as well. And to do that, Stalin wants to um, what is called collectivize um, uh, agriculture, which means farmers need to give up their own plots of land and need to enter into huge uh, farms which are collectively run and which do a kind of industrial scale agriculture. The thing is, farmers don't want this. And this is forced on the farmers with violence. And one of the ways uh, Stalin does this in Ukraine is by simply taking all the grain and leaving not enough grain for the farmers to feed themselves. So he creates an artificial famine. I hope you're all sitting comfortably because the, the lowest amount estimate of the number of deaths is 3 million. The larger amounts are 9 million. However, the, the, the higher the amount gets, the more political the claim is, um, you, might, you might imagine. So um, a fair estimate would be 4.5 million. So 4.5 million Ukrainians, uh, Russians also, in Ukraine are starved to death to force Stalin's policies. Nevertheless, when Putin says the Bolsheviks have created Ukraine, he means this republic, this Soviet republic. And this republic will get larger, as we will see. But before we can do that, we need to go to, well, Ukrainians are just Nazis, the, that, that trope Putin uses. To do that, we need to go to uh, the, basically the Polish part of Ukraine. Over here, like, there are anti-Ukrainian policies, assimil assimilation policies by the Polish government, but like, there is more freedom in Poland than in the Soviet Union. And um, in Poland, there are nationalists, veterans from the nationalist movement in the uh, early 20th century you are unhappy with how things went down for the Ukrainians and they form a new nationalist organization the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists the Organizacja Ukrainskich Nationalistów their first leader is a man called Yevhen Konovalitz you see him here it's the, the left photo and their ideology can be best described as first of all anti-semitic and they also equate Bolshevism with Judaism, that Bolshevism is understood as a Jewish plot against the Ukrainian nation. And they also believe in the principle of, well, one nation, one party, one leader. So I think it's fair to call them fascists. Um, and they are underground in Poland. And they aim for a mono-ethnic Ukrainian nation state with one national leader. And they have a set of Ten Commandments. I'll give you a few of them. You shall attain a Ukrainian state or die fighting for it. You will not hesitate to even commit the greatest crime if the good cause asks for it, for it. You will receive the enemies of your nation with hate and deceit. And their mode of operation in the 1930s is terror attacks on Ukrainians who don't agree with their policy, uh, but also murdering Polish ministers. Um, and one person who is involved with that is Stepan Bandera, um, the guy on the right. 
In 1938, Yevhen Konovalets is killed by the Soviet security service, by the NKVD, in, mind you, Rotterdam. He is blown um, uh, up with a bomb on the Kohl single in Rotterdam. And you can still visit his, his grave in Rotterdam to this day. Um, so, they seek allies as well. And what is their natural ally? That's Nazi Germany. And um, they build the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, have contacts with, say, German military uh, intelligence. Um, and after the death of Konovalets, Stepan Bandera, he becomes the leader of a radical faction of this movement. And um, they see Germany as an ally in the fight with their main enemy, the Soviet Union. And then we enter the Second World War. Both Stalin and Hitler know in 1939 they cannot afford, of, they cannot afford a war amongst themselves. So they conclude this treaty, which is called the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, a non-aggression pact, but in it they also divide amongst themselves the land in between of them. So basically, when, the Soviet, when uh, Hitler invades Poland on September 1st of 1939, uh, Stalin follows on September 17th and annexes the east of Poland in the Belarusian and Ukrainian um, Soviet republics. And the, this, is, this means that Soviet Ukraine is enlarged and subsequently faces a huge, uh, massive repression of Ukrainian nationalists. So on February 23rd of this year, Russian state television aired this image of Ukraine. It says that, well, this thing over here, this yellow thing over here, this is Ukraine. And, well, this is something given to them by Russian czars. This is something given to them, it's a present, by Vladimir Lenin. This is something which Stalin gave to them. And you can see the dates they basically align with the events we have been talking about. Oh, and this thing, the Crimea, is given to them, according to this picture, by Nikita Khrushchev in uh, 1954. So basically when Putin says, well, well, I'll show you what real decommunization means, is basically, well, you'll be left with this thing over here, which is where the Cossacks were in the 17th century. The thing is, from a Ukrainian perspective, things look rather differently. There is such a thing as Ukrainian nationalism, and there is a, a reasonable cause for a Ukrainian state. Um, but their claims are as exclusive as the Russian claims. From a helicopter view, things like, look very differently, as we might have noticed. So during the war, especially after the Germans invade in June 1941, well, the Ukrainian nationalists start collaborating with the Nazis, and this is not a, 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 a nice picture to look at. They declare a um, Ukrainian state in July 41, and at that time there are pogroms against the Jewish population of Lviv, at the same time when the state is declared. Well, the Nazis want to hear nothing about that. They arrest the nationalist leaders who do that, but nevertheless, Ukrainians uh, serve in, Ukrainian nationalists serve in the Nazi auxiliary police. And um, they are instrumental in the Holocaust in Ukraine and Belarus. Without these Ukrainian nationalists, Hitler couldn't have killed as many Jews as he did. At the end of the war, the Ukrainians also, the nationalists form a um, partisan army, the Ukrainian insurgents army. And this army, um, well, at the end of the war starts um, committing anti-Semitic violence, but also seeks to cleanse the, and actually cleanses parts of the west of Ukraine from its Polish population. And the Poles answer in likewise terms. So, um, well, these Ukrainian nationalists are also responsible for millions of deaths. And this is w part of what Putin refers to when he talks about Ukrainians are Nazis. Of course, the Soviet Union also tells a story about history. Their story is, di is this. The Second World War, or Great Patriotic War, as it's called in Russian, the 
Великая Отечественная война is a moment of glory. The Soviet Union has beaten the evil of fascism and liberated the world of Nazi slavery. And this becomes a binding narrative the Soviet Union uses to bind together the Soviet state. That also implies everything which didn't fight with us is evil. Um, so the collaboration of the Ukrainian nationalists with Nazi Germany is now used as an alibi to attack and suppress Ukrainian nationalism in Ukraine. And the word Banderovci, followers of Stepan Bandera, is made into a curse word in Russian. And it is still a curse word in Russian today. Please note that when I say Ukrainian nationalists, you may think in the tens of thousands. If I say Ukrainian Red Army fat veterans, I have two and a half millions. So there are many more Ukrainians who actually fight with the Soviet Union than against the Soviet Union. Um, but this story rings a bell, especially in the east of Ukraine also. So after the Second World War, there are population exchanges with Poland, and Ukraine becomes more or less a homo homogeneous state. The West is fairly Ukrainian. The East um, has very different zones. Southeastern Ukraine is Russian-speaking. Eastern Ukraine is Russian-speaking. And those regions are a bit different in their attachment with um, Ukraine. But mind you, Russian-speaking is not the same as Russian in Ukraine. You can speak Russian and call yourself a Ukrainian. That's a perfectly le legitimate way of identifying yourself. And after the war, Ukraine is a very important republic in the Soviet Union, like it's the power base for figures like Nikita Khrushchev and Leonid Brezhnev. So two of the main post-war Soviet leaders have their power base in Ukraine. It's an integral part of the Soviet Union, and after Russia, definitely the most important Soviet republic. And this republic becomes independent in 1991 because, well, the Ukrainian nationalists, who are a minority in Ukraine, they strike a deal with the communist establishment in Ukraine who feel that, well, the Soviet Union is going down south and they need a, an, an, alter an, uh, an alternative to keep their power, prestige, uh, corrupt practices, etc. So they simply trade, well, their ideology from communism to nationalism. And um, this way, Ukraine becomes an independent nation. And the new state needs a national history as a legitimation. And this is found in claims on Kievan Rus. It's found in claims on the glory of the Cossacks. And more controversially, on the Ukrainian nationalists in the 20th century, especially in the 30s and 40s, who are made into national heroes, which is a policy I find particularly problematic. If we go to more recent events, when all the everything we're dealing with today started, 2013, the so-called pro-Russian president, actually just a very corrupt president, Yanukovych, refused to sign an association uh, a, a treaty with the EU, basically because Russia blackmailed Ukraine in economic terms, and also because Russia just offered a better deal. Yet, like corrupt president of Ukraine, would you like this huge sum of money with no strings attached versus the EU's, well, I have some subsidies for you, but you have to do anti-corruption reform, you have to do, you might imagine which deal you would choose. Like, if I were a corrupt president, I would know which deal I would choose. Definitely not the EU's deal. Um, but this starts protests, which are violently repressed. There are dictatorial laws imposed on the country. And this violent, violence ends in a massacre in February of 20, 2014. Uh, we still don't know actually how and why, but what we do know is these protesters, peaceful protesters, start defending themselves. And the defense is led by ultra-right-wing nationalists, who are definitely neo-Nazis. Um, the president flees the country. He is deposed by parliament. There are new elections for a new president. Um, but, like, nationalist slogans are, are now normalized. Is what happened in 2014 a Nazi coup? Well, 
No. It starts with the president using force against peaceful protesters. Um, and in the subsequent presidential election, there are two ultra-nationalist candidates. One of them you might call a neo-Nazi. And together they have 1.86% of the vote <coughs> in a country of 40 million people. And, um, well, in parliament, the, 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 the nationalist parties, the neo-Nazi parties, have seven out of 450 seats. And imagine Ukraine has a dual system. Part of parliament is elected, uh, uh, is elected proportionally, like in the Netherlands, and part is elected by, uh, by district, like in the US or in the UK. And they only have the latter types of seats. Also says something about how much neo-Nazism or Nazism is accepted in Ukraine. And by the way, if we talk about, say, neo-Nazi violence, there's one country in Europe which leads the pack, and that's Russia, and not Ukraine. But the thing is, the new regime starts really to use nationalist rhetoric and starts to uh, make heroes out of problematic nationalists from the past in a response also to what Russia is doing in 2014, annexing the Crimea, stoking up a fake war in the east of the country. And of course, that gives Putin an extra weapon to hit the Ukrainians with, right? So that's also part of what has been going on. Well, then we come to uh, more of our time. Zelensky, the current president, becomes president in 2019. Um, his predecessor, Petro Poroshenko, who has used this nationalist rhetoric, he campaigns on the slogan, Armea Mova Vira, Army, um, Language, and Faith, Religion, so to say. And he has instituted laws, of which I'm not a great fan, and I've written a book about those laws, so I know what I'm talking about, um, which... Um, basically says, well, all Soviet symbols are banned. And this goes this far, like, the Communist Party is banned, not because it's anti-constitutional, anti because it has the name communist in its name. Like, I'm not a fan of these laws, just be sure. And he also bans criticism of Ukrainian nationalist heroes, like, um, those laws might bring me into problems. So I have a problem with these laws. However, um, this is just something which a minority of Ukrainians feel important. And the, uh, the candidate uh, who comes in, Zelensky, he says, well, actually, Poroshenko, you promised to do um, anti-corruption reforms, and he didn't do anything of that. So who is Zelensky? Zelensky is a TV comedian who, in his TV comedy, accidentally becomes president. He's a history teacher in the series. Um, because he promises to end corruption and then tries to reform the Ukrainian state but doesn't succeed in that. And um, he starts running as a presidential candidate and uses exactly the same rhetoric. He says, I'm an outsider. I'm not part of the political system, so you can trust me. I will not be a corrupt politician like all politicians, politicians have been in Ukraine during its independent nationhood, in a, or independent statehood. Um, and also, I will bring peace. But is he really an outsider? His program runs on a television channel, which is owned by one of the big business people in Ukraine with political connections, who also ran the largest bank in the country, which went bankrupt because, well, this business person used it as his personal purse. Um, I find it really, really convenient that we have a TV comedian from his channel who first runs like a campaign by being a TV comedian, then becoming a real politician. And yes, he, well, um, he, he, over the last years, he really started to do some reforms, but initially he wasn't really good at that. But, um, just to say, um, is this president a Nazi? Well, he has a Jewish family. His first prime minister was Jewish. 
So that would mean that we have a Nazi-ruled state in Europe with a Jewish president and a Jewish prime minister? That's something I find hard to believe. And Zelensky, he uh, hammered down on, on those nationalist policies. They are still in place, but they are less strict now, or were less strict now. I don't know where things will head, because nationalism has gotten a big boost in the last few weeks, you might imagine. But um, he is definitely not a radical uh, neo-Nazi uh, nationalist. So, by way of a conclusion, we can't really conclude anything about this situation yet. But history and interpretations of history are part of the core of this very conflict. Um, but there is much more to discuss. There is this ghost of NATO expansion. Go, uh, like That rings in the conflict as well. You have the Russian worldview versus a Western worldview, which are very different. You also have the, the development in Russia. Russia, uh, after 2012, becomes a rather repressive state. And there are upcoming elections in 2024, so this might just be part of the campaign for the 2024 elections, so to say. But those are just some minor thoughts. In short, there is much more, and I have already used a, like 15 minutes more time than I was allowed. Um, there's much more to tell about Ukraine, about Russia, about this whole conflict than I can do here. And even on the things I have discussed with you today, there are much more perspectives than just mine. But I hope to have given you some kind of more in-depth um, knowledge, which is also more detached from, well, the tweets of the day, so to say, which are usually just distractive of, like, the real analysis. So, well, then we have the big question mark at the end, I guess. questions. I'll come to you on my phone. Test. Well. Yes, it's working. What is the reason that can I hear every oh yeah. Okay, what's the reason that we only uh, uh, ag agree when uh, two countries are in conflict? One is winning, one is losing. The winning tells the rules for the losing part. You understand me? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, I the, can. Okay. Yeah. Why do we agree about that? That's a rather strange thing. It's, it's, it's rather a way of acting like an animal. I'm, I'm the stronger, so I am right. I don't know whether I agree with the statement that what what we might call might is right. Yes. Like, um, it used to work like that. But actually, under international law, it doesn't work anymore like that. Um, unfortunately, under international law, there are also very little uh, ways of enforcing the rule of law in, in, in between states. And that's one major problem. But, well, if like, say, Putin gets anything out of this war in terms of, um, in terms of compromises from Ukraine, say, a neutral status or recognition of the annexation of the Crimea, that would be not only a loss for Ukraine, but would be a loss for all of us. That would be a loss for the validity of international law as we know it. It would create precedent. Unfortunately, we are part of the problem because the whole language Russia uses, Russia, Russia says it's doing good in Ukraine, right? It's ridding the world of Nazism. It's also enforcing, um, so to say, human rights. That's what, it's, what Russia says it does. It doesn't do that, but it, it, like, that's the Russian claim. That's something they stole from us because we started doing that in... 1999 in Kosovo. We started doing that um, in Iraq 
um, we, and, and in other places as well. It used to be the way that sovereignty was something which you couldn't violate. But we, the West, we created a, a way to violate sovereignty because we also thought human rights were important to protect by force. And we enabled Putin's narrative in a way as well. There was a question over there, I believe. Okay. It really helps, by the way, to keep it like this. Like, you're almost going to kiss it. <laughs> Who had a question? Yeah, just uh, this, this question. Uh, what will be the situation uh, next year? Will Putin succeed? <laughs> I think if I really knew the question, uh, the, the answer to that question, I would have another job. I would probably also have a Nobel Peace Prize in two years. <laughs> um, as an historian, my, my trade isn't really... Um, no, I look backwards. I don't look forwards. Um, and my, my tools are just... Um, I cannot predict the future with my tools. But I can make educated guesses. Um, but the thing is, the situation now is very complex, and it's very difficult to know how things will go. Like, the scenario in which Putin loses control of Russia and is either shoved away in a, a palace coup, or that there is some kind of revolution in, in Russia, is a plausible scenario. But it is as much a plausible scenario as the scenario that, well, Russia maybe eventually succeeds in beating the bulk of the Ukrainian army and hammers out a deal uh, along the lines I just discussed. That's a feasible scenario as well. But that's how the situation is now. Um, we actually don't know what, what will come out of this. Yes, uh, before 2014, did the people of the Crimea and the Donbas like did they major like uh, were they did they see themselves as Russian or as Ukrainian? Thank you for your question because it allows me to tell things which I couldn't tell in my my talk. Um, there is a difference between the Crimea and the rest of Ukraine. The Crimea has a a, a whole different history. The original population of the Crimea is Turkish the Crimean Tatars, they are Muslim. But after the 18th century, the territory was slowly Russified. And most people in the Crimea identify as Russians and speak Russian as well. Ukrainians are a minority. So, um, Ukraine, the Crimea is a special case. The Donbass is a different region of Ukraine. It's, it has been part of Ukraine from the moment Ukraine became a republic in the Soviet Union. But because this was the main industrial region in the country, you have a huge influx of people from all over the Soviet Union. And most of the people in the Donbass in 1991 actually identify really as Soviet citizens, not really as Russians. They speak Russian, but they identify as Soviet citizens. And that becomes morphed into, well, attachment to Russia, but like it's difficult to gauge that region. What is interesting though is that in 1991 when Ukraine declares its independence there has been a referendum in Ukraine on Ukrainian independence and there is no region in Ukraine which voted against independence. Even in the Crimea, 54, but I might be wrong like by one or two percent. 54% um, of the population voted for independence of Ukraine. In the Donbass, the figures are much higher, um, say, high in the 60s, low in the 70s. Um, so that's very difficult to gauge. Um, it's, or it's very difficult to gauge what that region is really heading for. Because after independence, the region starts to become well, like the bulwark for pro-Russian policies. It's also where the people like Yanukovych have their power base. So they also use that, use that engineer out 
an electorate by using pro-Russian policies. It's also something they do. Um, so it might just very well be the case that if you would have done a fair referendum in the Crimea in 2014, you would have gotten a vote for, uh, we want to join Russia. For the Donbass, probably, well, I don't know. It's difficult to gauge, but it would have been a, a, a possible outcome. But the Russian-speaking part outside, like in Kharkiv or um, um, like Odessa, that's again a very different region where people might call themselves Ukrainians but speak Russian. And then there are also huge parts of the country where you can't really, like people maybe indicate I speak Ukrainian or I speak Russian, but like if you open your ears you would hear something which is neither Ukrainian nor Russian but something in between. So Ukraine is a very complicated country. And identity works in divergent ways, so to say. However, after 2014, the, the country united much more. Like, it really feels like we're under attack by a foreign nation, and we need to protect ourselves, show unity, and things which were unthinkable beforehand, like Russian speakers using ultra-nationalist slogans, um, from the 1930s or 40s are now possible. Uh, how much uh, difference is between uh, Russian and Ukrainian language? <laughs> do, do they that's understand each other? Yeah. Um, well, that's also a very intriguing question. Um, thing is, comparing, like we might compare it to, say, Dutch or G and German, which have a degree of mutual intelligibility. Um, but then you have Dutch and Afrikaans, which is like very intelligible mutually, but all those comparisons go wrong in such a way. So what you must consider is, first of all, the Eastern Slavic realm is a dialect continuum. So people speaking in the local dialect in, say, um, the eastern part of the Ukrainian uh, phone territory, they can speak to people on the Russian side of the border uh, without any problem. It works the same way here in Groningen. If you go to, to Bunde, just across the border, yep. you can speak in, in, in Gronings, right? So that's one thing. But if you look at the standard languages, they're both Slavic languages from the same part of the Slavic languages, and Slavic languages are highly mutually intelligible. Mm -hmm. um, like grammar, is, there are some differences, but grammar is more or less the same. But in terms of pronunciation, um, the languages are very different. In terms of uh, vocabulary, Ukrainian uses a lot more words from, say, Germanic languages. Uses a lot more words from Polish. Um, and also, um, like, you all know the word Maidan, probably. It's the Ukrainian word for square. But that's just Arab. It's the Arab word for square. It comes to Ukrainian via Turkish. So it's very difficult, actually, for a Russian person to understand Ukrainian. It's more easier for a Ukrainian to understand Russian. But it works probably the same with Dutch and German. Um, what do you think is the main reason for current war? Is it, from your lecture, it would be the anger of Russia about Ukrainian nationalism. However, there is the other side of the NATO's expansion east and their demands of Russia, their main demand is that Russia or Ukraine stays neutral. They don't have the main claim that Zelensky has to step down, which you would expect if your main reason for your anger is a nationalistic government. I don't know whether that's par the last part is true because denazification is one major uh, Russian claim. 
or was initially one of the major Russian claims, and denazification is something you can explain as Zelensky has to go. But um, what you say as two different things, I see as two coins or two sides of the same coin. And what we see here is a clash of how, like, perceptions of how the world works. Russia has a perception of how the world works, which is radically different from a Western way of perceiving how the world works, and the Ukrainians are caught in the middle. Um, nowadays, mainly agreeing with the Western way of how the world worked, but in 1991, that, that went down in a different way. Um, and those are two sides of the same coin, because well, Russia believes um, NATO is a threat to um, Russia's very existence. That's what Putin made adamantly clear. But the existence of Ukraine is also um, a threat to Russia's existence. And it's the same strand of thought. But they are expressions of that thought in different arenas. But then you might ask, why now and not 10 years ago? Well, first of all, the war already started eight years ago and not three weeks ago. Um, and why now? Because this narrative um, has gotten more influential because Putin has worked out most of, most of the business people from his inner circle, has worked out um, most of the more liberal voices from his inner circle, and he is now in an echo chamber with all um, like ex-KGB people who really believe these kinds of narratives and see threats in everything. So that's my short answer to your question. Which is still not really an answer. Which is not an answer. <laughs> Why is it not an answer? What do you think is the main reason? Because Russia believes the world works differently than the West. Or not so, so much Russia, but Putin, who controls Russia and the Russian state, believes the world works in a different way than we perceive it to work. So their, their fear of more of the sp spiritual um, killing that Ukraine is doing by being a separate nation is the same, has the same value for them as the NATO's expansion. Exactly. East. All right. Exactly. Cool. Because, like, Ukraine is a fake identity created by the West to undermine Russia. Yeah. Okay. Everyone stand up. Oh, ho, oh, oh. <laughs> um, ho. Uh, the ideas of, um, from Putin, um, do they also apply for the Baltic states and Georgia, countries like Georgia? Um, well, your question is a very valid one and one which we really need to think about. Um, in, like, in practice or in theory, they most certainly agree uh, or apply to those territories. Um, by the way, Putin already showed that in Georgia in 2008. So, like, we don't have to discuss Georgia that much. That's, like, already demonstrated. As for the Baltic states, in, in, in theory that might apply, but I do hope Putin realizes that those countries are in NATO and that that has consequences. If not, we have a major problem. But you think Georgia will be the, the next victim? No. Uh, I don't know whether Georgia will be the next victim because um, after 2008, Georgia went down in its policies, went down a whole different way than Ukraine did. Like 2008 was a warning signal to, to Ukraine, to uh, Georgia and to NATO. And afterwards, Georgian policy changed. Um, uh, and so I don't know whether Georgia will be the next victim. 
um, of Russian aggression. But what I can say is that if Georgia moves more to the west, then we might see a repeat of what we see now. Well, Georgia wants to join uh, the EU and, and NATO. Yeah, they say, sure, they say so. But they also know that that's not something which is feasible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> this question has been going. A short <laughs> question. Where does the term uh, Ukraine come from? Oh, historically. That's an interesting question. What it, does the word Ukraine mean? Well, the, the root of the word Ukraine, Ukraina, is kraj, and kraj means edge. So it means the edge of someone's territory. It means you can translate it as borderland. And then the question is, whose borderland? And the term Ukraine, Ukraina, um, according to Putin's view, it's Russia's borderland. However, the, f the term first arises with the Cossacks in a period when they are technically the subjects of the Polish king. So I think historically you couldn't translate it as Poland's borderland. But it means borderland. You had a question, yes? Can you tell something about possible uh, practical considerations? Like, for instance, I read that uh, irrigation systems to the Crimea have been cut off. Uh, oil uh, pipelines have been cut off. So in, in how far has all this been just uh, make up for very practical considerations? And which are these practical considerations, if so? Well, first of all, the irrigation of the Crimea that's one of the reasons Crimea was made part of Ukraine, because it's dependent on water supply from Ukraine. And that's why it was made part, one of the reasons it was made part of the Ukrainian Soci Socialist Soviet Republic in 1954. Um, as to oil supplies, uh, oil, oil supplies and gas supplies, Russia says they are still delivering it to Western Europe via Ukraine at this very moment. Whether that's feasible when the war keeps going on, definitely not. Um, one of the things which, um, which is maybe like some economic thing going on behind the scenes is this. Ukraine, in, in, like in the early 90s, Ukraine had no way of paying Russia for gas. But it was the main transit route, so Russia had no other option than just supply the gas against huge discounts. That might be a reason for realigning Ukraine into the like, Russian political system. But I don't think rational arguments are in play nowadays. Because like any rational president, knowing what the cost would be, like a 15% decrease of GDP structurally, that's what we're talking about in Russia. Like any reasonable operating politician would have made another choice. We are seeing a war of ideology. That's my sincere conviction. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, so you mentioned that there was this historical feud between Poland and Russia. And then we also saw that as soon as Russia declared war on Ukraine, Poland was the first country to um, offer aid and weapons. Um, so my question is, do you believe that Poland has any interests in uh, Ukraine itself and annexing territory? N nowadays, Poland is not going to annex any... Um, any Ukrainian territory. Why not? Because all claims between Poland and Ukraine have basically been settled because after the Second World War there have been population exchanges. So all the Ukrainians in Poland were sent to, to Soviet Ukraine and all Poles in Soviet Ukraine were sent to Poland. And the, the, like there are still some Polish, there is a small Polish minority, mainly in the cities in Western Ukraine, uh, 
but this doesn't create any real problems. And the Poles also know that, and they have been saying this since the early 90s. I have criticized Poland for this in the past, but I have to come back from those criticisms now. But they have been saying since the early 90s, Russia is going to come back into Central Europe. We will be um, attacked by Russia. Um, so they also know that they, they have to support Ukraine. And that's their sincere conviction. And it doesn't really matter whether that is um, something the, um, the present, like right-wing Polish government will say. But if you have a more liberal government in Poland, they will say exactly the same thing. They will say it a little more softer, but not much. All right, I think we have time for one more, but maybe you're all asked out. <laughs> I see one more. In uh, 1994, there was a treaty between Russia, Ukraine, uh, England, or uh, UK, and USA uh, about the, nu the nuclear uh, weapons inside of Ukraine. And um, Ukraine uh, delivered his nuclear weapons to Russia and as a, uh, war, uh, as a uh, in exchange for that, Russia recognized Ukraine's territorial integrity, right. and um, the UK and the US uh, said they they would vouch for that. Basically, that was the deal. So, nukes to Russia, and Ukraine gets security guarantees. True. And what's the question connected to that? Why doesn't Putin recognize those treaties? There are two, by the way, after World War II, all the uh, countries in Europe accept their borders. Yeah, that's also, the, uh, also Russia. Yeah, well, the Soviet Union back then. Uh, that's the Helsinki Treaty, 1975, the <laughs> Helsinki Accords. Um, well, why does Putin doesn't uh, why Putin doesn't recognize that, first of all, the Helsinki Treaty is a treaty, or the Helsinki Accords are very much vested into like the Western view of how international law works. Putin doesn't believe in that system. And then Putin didn't put his autograph under the, <laughs> the Budapest uh, Memorandum. And um, Putin basically thinks that is bogus because the very existence of Ukraine is a security threat to Russia. And in his view, if there is a security threat, you have a legitimate reason for military, uh, military action against your neighbor. But with this reasoning, like you can square anything. And that's a major problem. I think on that note, um, we'll um, leave it at that. Thank you very much, Nicolas, for You're more than welcome. incredibly informative lecture. <laughs> and thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, we have a lot more programs coming up in the near future. Um, now that the rules have changed a little bit, um, we really hope to welcome you more often again. And um, have a great evening. Thank you.